Lesson 10 Jesus opens the way through the veil. Sabbath afternoon, February 26. What a source of joy to the disciples to know that they had a friend in heaven to plead in their behalf. Through the visible ascension of Christ, all their views and contemplation of heaven are changed. Now heaven was connected with the thought of Jesus, whom they had loved and reverenced above all others. They now looked upon it as their future home, where mansions were being prepared for them by their loving Redeemer. Prayer was clothed with a new interest since it was a communion with their Savior. With new and thrilling emotions and a firm confidence that their prayer would be answered, they gathered in the upper chamber to offer their petitions and to claim the promise of the Savior who had said, Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. They prayed in the name of Jesus. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1054. Jesus stands in the Holy of Holies now to appear in the presence of God for us. There he ceases not to present his people, moment by moment, complete in himself. But because we are thus represented before the Father, we are not to imagine that we are to presume upon his mercy and become careless, indifferent, and self-indulgent. Christ is not the minister of sin. We are complete in him, accepted in the Beloved, only as we abide in him by faith. Perfection through our own good works we can never attain. The soul who sees Jesus by faith repudiates his own righteousness. He sees himself as incomplete, his repentance insufficient, his strongest faith but feebleness, his most costly sacrifice as meager, and he sinks in humility at the foot of the cross. But a voice speaks to him from the oracles of God's word. In amazement, he hears the message, Ye are complete in him. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Now all is at rest in his soul. No longer must he strive to find some worthiness in himself, some meritorious deed by which to gain the favor of God. Reflecting Christ, page 76. The beloved John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks with great plainness and assurance. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Then press your petition to the Father in the name of Jesus. God will honor that name. The rainbow round about the throne is an assurance that God is true, that in him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We have sinned against him and are undeserving of his favor. Yet when we come to him confessing our unworthiness and sin, he has pledged himself to give heed to our cry. The honor of his throne is staked for the fulfillment of his word unto us. Like Aaron, who symbolized Christ, our Savior bears the names of all his people on his heart in the holy place. Our great high priest remembers all the words by which he has encouraged us to trust. He is ever mindful of his covenant. Christ's Object Lessons, page 148. Sunday. February 27. Jesus Before the Father The slaying of the Passover lamb was a shadow of the death of Christ. Says Paul, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. The sheaf of first fruits, which at the time of the Passover was waved before the Lord, was typical of the resurrection of Christ. Paul says, in speaking of the resurrection of the Lord and of all his people, Christ, the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23. 
Like the wave sheaf, which was the first ripe grain gathered before the harvest, Christ is the first fruits of that immortal harvest of redeemed ones that at the future resurrection shall be gathered into the garner of God. These types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the time. On the fourteenth day of the first Jewish month, the very day and month on which for fifteen long centuries the Passover lamb had been slain, Christ, having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted that feast which was to commemorate his own death as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That same night he was taken by wicked hands to be crucified and slain. And as the antitype of the wave sheaf, our Lord was raised from the dead on the third day, the first fruits of them that slept, a sample of all the resurrected just. The Great Controversy, page 399. Beholding the perfection of Christ's character, contemplating his mission, his love, his grace, his truth, believers are charmed. The great want of the soul is met, and they will say with the psalmist, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Psalm 17, verse 15. The divine object of faith and love they see to be Jesus Christ. With them the love of the world, the worshipping of earthly treasures, have come to an end. Such a soul appropriates the word of God to himself. He sees that the miracles, the self-denial, the self-sacrifice of Christ, his being lifted up on the cross, were for him. The language of the heart will be, He died for me. He triumphed in death that I should not perish, but believe in him as my personal Savior and have that life which measures with the life of God. In the riches of his grace, I am possessed of treasures that are as enduring as eternity. That I may know him, page 216. At times a deep sense of our unworthiness will send a thrill of terror through the soul. But this is no evidence that God has changed toward us or we toward God. No effort should be made to rein the mind up to a certain intensity of emotion. We may not feel today the peace and joy which we felt yesterday, but we should by faith grasp the hand of Christ and trust Him as fully in the darkness as in the light. The Sanctified Life, page 90. Monday, February 28. God's Invitation By his mighty power, notwithstanding the opposition of Pharaoh, God delivered his people from Egypt that they might keep the law which had been given in Eden. He brought them to Sinai to hear the proclamation of this law. By proclaiming the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel with his own voice, God demonstrated their importance. In awful grandeur, he made known his majesty and authority as ruler of the world. This he did to impress the people with the sacredness of his law and the importance of obeying it. The power and glory with which the law was given reveal its importance. It is the faith once delivered to the saints by Christ our Redeemer speaking from Sinai. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, pages 197 and 198. Most earnestly, David studied the ways of God expressed by Christ when enshrouded in the pillar of cloud and given to Moses to be faithfully repeated to all Israel. As David considered his pledges and promises to them, knowing they were for all who need them as much as for Israel, he appropriated them to himself, saying, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doing. His faith laid hold of God, and he was strengthened and encouraged. Although he recognized God's ways as mysterious, yet he knew they were merciful and good, for this was his character as revealed to Moses. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. 
and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 3, page 1149. The captain of our salvation strengthens his followers, not with scientific falsehoods, but with genuine faith in the word of a personal God. This word is repeated over and over and over again with deeper affirmative power. Satan brings all his powers to the assault in the last close conflict, and the endurance of the follower of Christ is taxed to the utmost. At times it seems that he must yield, but a word of prayer to the Lord Jesus goes like an arrow to the throne of God, and angels of God are sent to the field of battle. The tide is turned, and the oppressed are delivered. The believing, harassed souls are borne up as on eagles' wings, and the victory is gained. What wonderful lessons we shall learn as the result of depending constantly on the sufficiency of Christ. He who is learning these lessons need not depend on another's experience. He has the witness in himself, and his experience is the actual knowledge that Christ is all-sufficient, faithful, and powerful. He has the realization of the promise, My grace is sufficient for thee. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 In heavenly places, Page 297. Tuesday, March 1. The Need for a Veil. In the sanctuary of the wilderness tabernacle and of the temple that were the earthly symbols of God's dwelling place, one apartment was sacred to his presence. The veil, inwrought with cherubim at its entrance, was not to be lifted by any hand save one. To lift that veil and intrude unbidden into the sacred mystery of the most holy place was death. For above the mercy seat dwelt the glory of the holiest, glory upon which no man might look and live. On the one day of the year appointed for ministry in the most holy place, the high priest with trembling entered God's presence while clouds of incense veiled the glory from his sight. Throughout the courts of the temple, every sound was hushed. No priests ministered at the altars. The host of worshipers, bowed in silent awe, offered their petitions for God's mercy. The Ministry of Healing, pages 437 and 438. It is not the highest work of education to communicate knowledge merely, but to impart that vitalizing energy which is received through the contact of mind with mind and soul with soul. It is only life that can beget life. What privilege then was theirs who for three years were in daily contact with that divine life from which has flowed every life-giving impulse that has blessed the world? Above all his companions, John, the beloved disciple, yielded himself to the power of that wondrous life. He says, The life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. 1 John chapter 1 verse 2 and John chapter 1 verse 16. In the apostles of our Lord, there was nothing to bring glory to themselves. It was evident that the success of their labors was due only to God. The lives of these men, the characters they developed, and the mighty work that God wrought through them are a testimony to what He will do for all who are teachable and obedient. The Desire of Ages, page 250. The soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in his sight than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. He will never abandon one for whom he has died. Unless his followers choose to leave him, he will hold them fast. Through all our trials, we have a never-failing helper. 
He does not leave us alone to struggle with temptation, to battle with evil, and be finally crushed with burdens and sorrow. Though now he is hidden from mortal sight, the ear of faith can hear his voice saying, Fear not, I am with you. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 I have endured your sorrows, experienced your struggles, encountered your temptations. I know your tears. I also have wept. The griefs that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear, I know. Think not that you are desolate and forsaken. Though your pain touch no responsive cord in any heart on earth, look unto me and live. The Desire of Ages, page 483. Wednesday, March 2. The New and Living Way Through the Veil. Those who truly believe in Christ sit together with Him in heavenly places. Let us accept the badge of Christianity. This is not an outward sign, not the wearing of a cross or a crown, but it is something that reveals the union of man with God. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. The Upward Look, page 233. The intercession of Christ in our behalf is that of presenting His divine merits in the offering of Himself to the Father as our substitute and surety. For he ascended up on high to make an atonement for our transgressions. He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. From this it is evident that it is not God's will that you should be distrustful and torture your soul with the fear that God will not accept you because you are sinful and unworthy. Present your case before him, pleading the merits of the blood shed for you upon Calvary's cross. Satan will accuse you of being a great sinner, and you must admit this, but you can say, I know I am a sinner, and that is the reason I need a Savior. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. I have no merit or goodness whereby I may claim salvation but I present before God the all-atoning blood of the spotless Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is my only plea. The name of Jesus gives me access to the Father. His ear, His heart, is open to my faintest pleading, and He supplies my deepest necessities. Reflecting Christ, page 75. Christ came to give to the world an example of what perfect humanity might be when united with divinity. He presented to the world a new phase of greatness in His exhibition of mercy, compassion, and love. He gave to men a new interpretation of God. As head of humanity, He taught men lessons in the science of divine government, whereby He revealed the righteousness of the reconciliation of mercy and justice. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 260. Thursday, March 3. They will see his face. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, 
verse 1. Have we not proved this in the past as we have moved out in faith to produce the things now seen? Faith is not only to look forward to things unseen. It is to be confirmed by looking at past experience, at tangible results, the verification of God's word. Pray, Lord, increase my faith. Faith quickens the senses to work diligently to produce results. Faith elevates and ennobles the powers of the soul, enabling it to lay hold upon the unseen. Looking unto Jesus, not only as our example, but as the author and finisher of our faith, let us go forward having confidence that he will supply us with all the strength that is needed for every duty. The Upward Look, page 72. Faith is needed in the smaller, no less than in the greater affairs of life. In all our daily interests and occupations, the sustaining strength of God becomes real to us through an abiding trust. Only the sense of God's presence can banish the fear that, for the timid child, would make life a burden. Let him fix in his memory the promise, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Let him read that wonderful story of Elisha and the mountain city, and, between him and the hosts of armed foemen, a mighty encircling band of heavenly angels. Let him read how to Peter, in prison and condemned to death, God's angel appeared. How, past the armed guards, the massive doors and great iron gateway with their bolts and bars, the angel led God's servant forth in safety. In no less marked a manner, then he wrought then, will he work now, wherever there are hearts of faith to be channels of his power. Reflecting Christ, page 127. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Through the beloved John, who listened to these words, the Holy Spirit declared to the churches, This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath a Son hath life. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And Jesus said, I will raise him up at the last day. Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because, through faith, his life has become ours. Those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of God, received into the heart by faith, is the beginning of the life eternal. The Desire of Ages, page 388. For further reading, God's Amazing Grace, Christ the Mediator, page 154, and Selected Messages, Christ our High Priest, book 1, pages 341 and 342.